and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I'm talking to Dr. Marianne Miller all the way from San Diego. Marianne has been in the mental health field for 27 years and has specialized in eating disorders for the last 12. Marianne was a full-time academic for 12 years and had a part-time eating disorder practice for much of that time until she left the university and went into private practice full-time in 2018. Dr. Marianne loves working with eating disorders as a therapist and a coach, and she takes a non-diet feminist approach that helps people of all genders live empowered, authentic lives. She embraces the health at every size model and is LGBTQIAA plus affirming. Dr. Marianne recently launched the Inevitable Binge Eating Recovery Online Program, and it helps high-achieving professionals regain their mental and emotional energy by shifting their relationship with food to be fully present in their life. In this episode today, Marianne talks about self-care and self-soothing and how binge eating can often be a way to regulate emotions and feel better. Marianne will explore common patterns seen in the therapy room and discuss tools to help regulate emotions and practice better self-care. And we will also, if we have time, dive into body image struggles, particularly when you're in a larger body and struggling with binge eating. You might carry a lot of shame around your body and this can be exacerbated by professionals not understanding binge eating and also unhelpfully then encouraging weight loss, which can then perpetuate this binge restrict cycle. And this can feel such a very lonely, isolating and shameful place to be in. Now, Marianne is the best person to be talking about all of this. She's got so much experience and passion about this area of work. You're going to learn so much from her. Let's get to the conversation. Hi, Marianne. So great to have you back on the podcast today. Oh, it's so great to be back. I love it. (laughs) So Marianne, I know you have been on the podcast a few times, but I'm sure there will still be some people that don't know you. Could you firstly please introduce yourself, please? Sure. I am an eating disorder therapist and binge eating coach, and I live in San Diego, California in the US. And I have been working with eating disorders for 12 years, and I'm licensed to practice therapy in California and Texas. And I do binge eating coaching for people everywhere in the US and abroad. So abroad for me, not abroad for you. (laughs) So yeah. Sure. No, thank you. And can you just give us a San Diego vibes? Because of like, oh. we're in the UK and it's cold and it's oh. raining. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, the sun is shining, the <laughs> sky is blue, and there's some puffy clouds in the sky, and the <laughs> palm trees are waving in the breeze, and it's just great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. I've absorbed all of that, I tell you. Yes, please do. <laughs> Yes, and there's flowers, and Mm. yes, it's lovely. (laughs) Even a unicorn in the garden. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Rainbows, butterflies. (laughs) So, Marianne, um, you're going to come talk to us again today about binge eating, and um, you've been on the podcast before, so people might want to check out some of those previous episodes, and we've talked about regular eating, balancing blood sugar, mental restriction, amongst other things. So if you're listening and you want to know more about binge eating, do go and check out those episodes because I know they have been really popular and people have got loads of value from them. Today, we're going to dive in a bit more to looking at self-care, self-soothing, maybe a bit more around the emotional side of binge eating. And then also as well, if we have time, we might sort of dive into body image as well. So I think some really, really great topics. Marianne, one thing I found with many of my clients, I wondered if you relate to this, is that many of my clients struggle with binge eating perhaps not so great often at self-care or self-soothing. And I think often like really motivated, 
highly driven individuals who like have very high standards yeah and like want to kind of like keep going keep going keep going keep going and would you like to share some of your thoughts on that something that you find in your practice yes absolutely very high achieving people very driven very full days like an example of someone would be like a mom who has a kid or two who has a very demanding job and they work all day and then they come home and do the quote second shift where they're taking care of their kids and they just literally have no time for themselves and they get to the evening and they're just utterly exhausted. They haven't been able to take a breath and the kids are in bed and they just want to do one thing for themselves. And that one thing is binging. And I can understand that because researchers have shown that people with binge eating disorder get more pleasure out of food than people without binge eating disorder. The dopamine receptors of the brain, dopamine's like the pleasure chemical in our brain. So the dopamine receptors in the brain are more sensitive to food. And so they get a lot more pleasure and it's a way for them to soothe themselves and like, quote, treat themselves at the end of the day and sometimes just numb out where they're just not feeling any emotions at all. And that works for the short term. (laughs) And unfortunately, immediately after the binge, they feel guilt, they feel shame, sometimes embarrassed. They think, oh, how could I I've done this again. I promise to be better tomorrow. And then like an hour after the binge, like the shame just compounds. And then they start thinking about ways they think they're failures in other areas of their life. And it just overgeneralizes. And then they feel terrible. And it all started with them just wanting to feel a little better and feel like they had some time to themselves. Helping people recover from binge eating is going back to what happened when you woke up in the morning? And how were you eating that day? Were you nourishing yourself during that day? Were you able to take little breaks during the workday for yourself? Or did you just steam right through? Did you skip lunch? Did you skip breakfast? Are you coming to the end of the day where you're in a major glucose deficit because you haven't eaten enough? Are you constantly juggling parenting without much help from your partner. Maybe you don't have a partner and it's all on you and you just don't have time to take a breath. It's really rewinding what's going on with them and saying, okay, how can we start that self-care and self-love process when you're not binging? Like when you first wake up in the morning and how can you set boundaries? How can you learn to take breaks at work. I I remember one person I worked with years ago, and I'm not sharing any identifying information. It's one thing that I shared is I say, when you eat your lunch, do you do it in front of the computer while you're still working? Or can you even move to a different chair in your office or go to a different room or go outside? In San Diego, the sun is usually shining, so (laughs) probably not in London or England or the UK. You know, can you go outside for a little bit? Even just shifting chairs, and that's something that during my own recovery that I began doing is when I was a professor, is I would turn off the computer or just close the laptop even, and then I would go to a different chair in my office and I would eat lunch there. And just kind of be quiet and just focus on nourishing myself. And that was a huge mental shift. And it took 15 minutes and it came back and I felt so much better. So you can build in those little self-care times. And by the time you hit the end of the day, you're not completely depleted. Mm -hmm. I love everything you're sharing there because I'm just so with you. I think the prevention of the binge eating and working back to the start of the day. Yes. It's just so much better, isn't it? Then by the time you're frazzled at the end of the day, is frazzled a word in the US? (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Yes. (laughs) I use it often. (laughs) Well, yeah, by the time you're kind of weary, tired, overwhelmed, completely emotionally spent, 
Yeah, maybe you finally finished your working day or you finally got your kids in bed. And yeah, it's so hard then, I think, if you are used to using binge eating and food as a means of soothing, switching off, escaping, gaining pleasure. It's really hard to make a decision not to do it when that pressure has been building all day, isn't it? So much more preferable to be able to start with the baby steps of implementing that self-care earlier on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes self-care means setting boundaries. And a lot of people that I work with, women especially, may not feel as though they have a voice. They don't feel like they have as strong of a voice at work. They don't feel like they're heard. Maybe they don't feel like they have a voice in their family of origin or their own families or maybe even some of their friendships or intimate partnerships. And there's a lot of pain there and a lot of unaddressed needs. The big thing that I do when I work with people is to help them address their needs and help them start setting boundaries and really working on some of their relationships. And for example, sometimes it means talking to Like if a college student is still living at home, at college, it's equivalent to university student in the UK is still living at home and their parents keep going and reading their diaries or their journals and they feel like their parents are being very intrusive and or maybe the parent has access to their phones and can read some of the things and that they're doing. And I think it's very important to learn how to set those boundaries so they feel like that they have space. And likewise, you have an adult who feels like disconnected from their partner and they want to go on vacations and their partner doesn't want to go on vacations and they feel like they have an unmet need there that's not being heard. And that also can contribute to binge eating. And one thing that I did, I remember when I was growing up as I really didn't feel like I had a voice. And there was a lot of control. I'm trying not to get too specific, but controlling behavior with one of my parents, especially. I vividly remember going and getting this treat at the grocery store, the market. And this was after I could drive. So I was like 16. I would go after school and I would buy this like pastry treat or something like that. And I would go home and run up to my room and just have tears running down my face and be like, ha, I'm going to show them because part of the control had to do with control over my food and feeling like you don't have a voice, like you don't have space to be yourself. It's such a huge source of pain. (laughs) and. When you think about it, that really cultivates a lot of compassion for people who are struggling with binge eating is is that they're in a lot of pain and they're just trying to feel better. And on a short-term basis, it does make them feel better. It did make me feel better on a short-term basis. It's just the long-term consequences of how I felt about myself and was not worth it. But For me at that time, I was just trying to survive. My guess is that a lot of the listeners who struggle with binge eating are just trying to survive their situations and they're just getting through it by binge eating. Yeah, it's so important to be compassionate, isn't it? Because it is a coping strategy. No one Mm -hmm. sets out to choose to use binge eating as a coping strategy. And I think because of the culture we live in as well, people can just feel like because of all the toxic messages and all the kind of pressure to lose weight and look a certain way, you can just feel like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I've just got no control around food when actually it's exactly what you're saying in a way. It's often about unexpressed needs, isn't it? About not having a voice. And I wonder if you can say a bit more, Marianne, as well about perhaps some of the feelings that are being suppressed when if you feel you have no control and you're using kind of food as that outlet, I guess there's some sort of quite powerful emotions underneath that. That's a great question. You've got the typical kind of anxiety, depression that's co-occurring or that is in existence with a lot of eating disorders and those kinds of things. But if you want to get more specific, I would say shame is a big one. Feeling like a failure, 
especially for those high achieving kind of perfectionistic type people who are constantly analyzing their performance and feel as though they don't measure up, feeling alone, feeling lonely, sometimes feeling bored. That can be one feeling isolated, feeling frustrated with something, feeling powerless. That's a big one is when they feel powerless or trapped. Those are just some really deep emotions. Those are hard. Those are really hard emotions to experience. Mm. And I think it'd be so hard, can't it? Because when you've been perhaps quite disconnected from your body, disconnected from your feelings, the food has been the way to kind of soothe, to numb, to dissociate. It can feel really scary to think about being in touch with those feelings and not Mm -hmm. using food to escape. So I'm wondering as well, and it's kind of a huge topic really, but what are some of the things that you, where might you start with your clients when they are beginning to tune in more to their emotions? I often have them pull up a feelings wheel or an emotion wheel. If you just Google feelings wheel or emotion wheel, it's like this circle and it has like spokes, like a wheel inside of it. And they have all these different emotions on the different spokes of the wheel. And they start with like some of the core emotions like anger, uh, happiness, sadness, that kind of thing. And then they go out to more detailed description like rage and, and frustration and that kind of thing outward in the spokes. A lot of times when I work with my clients and I ask them, what are you feeling? They just look straight at me and they're like, I don't know. I have no idea. Or they sort of like, uh, sort of anxious. I don't know. It's a lot of times very difficult for them to pinpoint the emotions they're experiencing. And so when they are able to get a template of what feelings they're feeling, that's incredibly helpful for them. And I particularly like John Gottman's, that's G-O-T-T-M-A-N. So if you just put Gottman's feeling wheel, he's a couples researcher out of the University of Washington, and he helps couples communicate their emotions better. It's a very, very helpful tool. So I have my clients sometimes even pull up the feeling wheel in session and say, okay, what are you feeling right now? And they're able to list off all the different emotions. And that can feel very powerful. And as my clients build their ability and their skills, because identifying your emotions, it's a skill. And so if you build up that skill, then it gives them something to say. It gives like the unknowable, it makes something that's unknowable, knowable. And that's Mm -hmm. very powerful to be able to say, no, I'm really, I feel enraged at my partner because I have to do all these things and they're not holding up their end of the bargain in terms of doing work and chores around the help or helping with the child rearing or something like that. I'm enraged at my boss. I feel very isolated in my family of origin because I feel like they don't listen to me. And it's incredibly powerful. I just have them practice every day is I have them pull up the feeling wheel once a day and I have them identify the emotions that they feel they can write it out in a journal and all they have to do is list the emotions. If they want to write a little bit about it, they can do that, but just list it out in their journal or use the notes app in their smartphone. That's very, very helpful. Just jotting it down. And then I have them bring it back to me in session and they say, okay, well, what are some of the common feelings? Like what are your common feeling themes of the week? And it's like, I didn't realize how angry I was or I didn't realize how lonely I was. It gives us a starting point. Be like, okay, so how could we work on that, on meeting that need and the loneliness? And how can we work on getting you to express that anger? And what are you actually angry about? And how can we do some problem solving to address that issue? Time for a short advertisement break. Now, I know we talk a lot about food freedom on this podcast and how important it is to take care of yourself mentally and physically as you learn to navigate a culture inundated with toxic messaging. One of the best ways to take care of yourself is through exercise, but I know it can be really hard to find an exercise program that isn't rooted in these toxic messages and doesn't feel triggering. Well, I recently met Katie, the owner of an amazing new exercise company called We Shape. We Shape doesn't focus on calorie counting, tracking how much you work out, or making you feel bad about your body to get you motivated. 
Instead, they create a customized exercise routine for you that helps you connect with and care for your body rather than feel the pressure to change it. They help you learn to set intentions that come from a place of self-care rather than self-judgment and they support you every step of the way with an amazing community and live coaching so you can make exercise a self-care practice that helps you feel better in your body and about your body. Plus, they're giving listeners of the show the chance to try it out for two full weeks for free. Just head on over to weshape.com forward slash freedom or check out the link in the show notes to get started today. Yeah, that's so helpful because I think until we start to have some awareness and having a language as well to name our feelings and just notice how they show up in the body as well. It's really difficult, isn't it, to be able to then think about what do I actually need in this moment because of possibly someone's just been completely disconnected from that, actually. They're not even, it's probably quite a surprise sometimes, isn't it? Like when you're sort of talking through the examples, but people hadn't realized how frustrated and angry they may have felt about a situation because they're so used to perhaps disconnecting from it. Yes. Just as a lot of people with eating disorders feel very disconnected from their bodies, they're disconnected from their emotions as well. A big part of recovery and therapy is getting people to reconnect to their emotions and reconnect to their bodies. Mm -hmm. And are there any particular practices that you would use with your clients just to really help them get back into their bodies a bit more to be a bit more present? I use a lot of mindfulness exercises, or I call them grounding exercises that really ground you in your body. I do the mindfulness exercise of the five things that's asked them to describe five things that they see, four things that their bodies are touching, three things that they hear, two things that they smell, and one thing that they taste. And that really helps them ground themselves in the present moment and ground themselves in what they're feeling. I sometimes do, it's called finger tracing. So if you hold your hand up and so if like if you're holding your left hand up and you take your pointer finger with your right hand and you start by tracing your thumb. So when you go up the side of your thumb, you inhale And then down the other side of your thumb, you exhale and you do that with all five of your fingers and then you switch and do it with your other hand too. So that helps because touching their hands helps ground themselves in their bodies and then taking deep breaths kind of slows the nervous system down. And that's really helpful too. And sometimes it's just having them describe to put both their feet on the floor and say, What does it feel like to have your feet on the floor and have them describe in detail what that feels like? Maybe focus a little bit more on areas of their bodies that aren't as emotional to think about. So feet, hands, elbows, (laughs) whatever, (laughs) you know, touch your hair and tell me what your hair feels like if that's not something that's stressful for them. So Mm, yeah, they're so helpful because I think Anyone listening to those sort of skills that you've described, actually, they're very practical things that we can Mm -hmm. start to implement almost sort of straight away, aren't they, to really help bring someone into the present moment. And it can feel very scary because there's a term that researchers and eating disorder therapists use. It's called interoception. And so interoception is the ability to have awareness of your body and kind of be in your body. And it's very common to have low interoception for people with eating disorders. That's a goal for eating disorder therapists is to improve interoception with people. And it's kind of scary. It's like a lot of times my clients are scared of their bodies. (laughs) It's like their bodies are the enemy, right? They're trying to change their bodies. And to get them to start being back in their bodies is very challenging. And so if we could do so in a way that's not as threatening, like using fingers and toes, hands and feet. And I always say elbows because elbows are always funny, like touch your elbow. (laughs) A lot of times people don't have any emotional attachment to their elbows. (laughs) So touch your elbow and describe to me how it feels. And it kind of makes them chuckle. And it's kind of a funny thing. Earlobes is another one. So (laughs) So you can even do that throughout the day. It's like, if you're kind of feeling 
outside your body a little bit, you can touch your elbows or your earlobes and areas of your body that don't stress you out. Yeah, and it's so helpful, isn't it? I think you're just so right there with elbows and earlobes. I hadn't really thought about it that much, but there's something yeah. about <laughs> they are both kind of like earlobes are quite nice and squishy, aren't they? And yes, elbows are a yes. bit pointy. There's <laughs> yep. there is yep. something quite grounding, I think, about connecting with those parts of the body. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's important for me as a therapist to explain to my clients that when we're going to improve interoception, we're going to improve your ability to be in your body and be aware of your body, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean to be like hyper-focused on the areas that you feel uncomfortable with. It's Mm -hmm. like elbows and earlobes. (laughs) (laughs) And Marianne, without diving too deeply into this topic for now, so you have to come back again to talk about this, but I'm just wondering as well, for people um, who are neurodiverse as well, perhaps if you've got ADHD Mm -hmm. or something, of course, like we've just talked about interoception and that being quite challenging for people generally with eating disorders and perhaps particularly binge eating. But obviously, if, perhaps if you're if you have sort of neurodiversity as well, you might be experiencing that on even another level. Is yeah. there anything that you would be kind of doing even a bit differently or around that kind of grounding and getting back into your body and improving that interoception? Wow, that's a really good question. Typically, the tips I just described uh, don't go over well with my neurodivergent clients. They find them, I don't know, silly, (laughs) uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. and like, why would I do that? (laughs) Fidget toys are huge, very, Mm -hmm. very helpful for people who are neurodivergent. And I use these myself. I've told a lot of my clients to get them. They're called monkey noodles. They're these long, stretchy, tube things and you get six in a pack and you can braid them and you could twirl them around and you can wrap them around. Like right now I have two of them. I'm wrapping them around my hand and wrist. And so it creates this pressure on my hand and wrist. And it almost feels like you have a little mini weighted blanket on your hand and wrist. And just that awareness grounds you into your body. And Same with like weighted blankets, weighted blanket, you can get like a lap size weighted blanket, you can get a full weighted blanket, any sort of like heaviness or pressure helps you get into your body a little bit more and calms down your nervous system. And that's really helpful for neurodivergent folks and fidget toys, fidget rings, any sort of it depends on my client as to what fidget toys they like. And I just tell them go to Amazon or some sort of site like that and just put fidget toys for adults in the search bar and you'll come up with a lot of things that you can do. I've had some clients like doodling, they doodle, but anything with like pressure or something that they can fidget and be active with. Putty is also something good. There's this brand called Aaron's Thinking Putty that it's a great, very durable brand and it comes in fun colors. And I've used that myself and I've had clients use that too. Oh, fantastic. I think really, really helpful tips. And did you say they're called monkey noodles? The ones? Monkey noodles. <laughs> they are fabulous. I mean, seriously, when I switched from working in person to all virtual during the pandemic, during the lockdown, it kind of got me through the transition from being in person to being on the computer all the time (laughs) because I could play with the monkey noodles when I was feeling uncomfortable being on the computer. Now it's like no big deal, but in the beginning it was a big transition. Mm, Plus I'm neurodivergent, so (laughs) (laughs) So it was a real help. (laughs) Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, I think it's just so great, actually, to just having this sort of conversation, because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who'll be like, oh, you know, perhaps I hadn't really thought of using yeah. fidget toys or what kinds are out there, or maybe I feel a bit silly, but it's just really, really validating, isn't it? That that can be a really oh, helpful yes. tool. Mm. So helpful. So helpful. And try multiple things. One thing may not work for one person as well as it works for another person. So try multiple things and see what works best for you. I mean, I sometimes have clients who are on meetings at work, like Zoom meetings, and they just put a weighted blanket on their lap. Another thing, I forgot, this is a really good one that I also use myself, is taking an ice pack and putting it on your chest. 
-hmm. So that helps when you're feeling like overwhelmed or maybe overstimulated. It really helps you kind of cool down and there's a heaviness to the ice pack. So it creates that and it makes you more aware of what your body is feeling, which lessens the emotional overwhelm. Mm, that's so interesting. Do you think there's an equivalent though for like if you live in the UK and it's freezing? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I would you have like a, a hot water bottle. <laughs> yeah, a hot water bottle, <laughs> heating pad, even just like a cup of tea, putting your hand around it, around the cup of hot tea or whatever. You could even just have a cup of hot water if you don't want to drink anything and just boiling water and then just hold the cup or the mug. And that can be very grounding for you. And if you're sipping on something that engages a couple of different senses, you have your hands with the mug and then you, the smell of the tea and then the taste of the tea. So if you can engage multiple senses, that's very helpful for you. Um, strong scents like citrus or lavender or peppermint or something, those can be also very calming and kind of help with the interoception because you're engaging the senses. Mm, yeah, that's so interesting. Well, I think Marianne, maybe like your next venture needs to be launching a range of like <laughs> your own Marianne Land fidget toys. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I totally want that. <laughs> That's a great idea, Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, wow. though, I think um, you sold me, actually, just like listening to it, just really identifying there is a real demand, I think, isn't there? Yeah. And, well, thank you for sharing that. Well, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll introduce it on my Dr. Mary Ann Land podcast and and say, hey, yeah. you're here at Dr. Mary Ann Land and you can buy these fidget toys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see, see if people are interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, great idea. Great idea. <laughs> so, Marianne, let's talk a little bit about body image now. Now, I know many people struggling with body image are in larger bodies. They can feel a lot of shame around this. There's a lot of narrative, isn't there, in diet culture from professionals, always being told to lose weight. And then, I think it's just a horrible situation, isn't it? Because I think obviously binge eating is often a coping strategy to deal with your emotions. You can feel really bad about your body and then actually you then turn to food to try and feel better and then you feel worse about your body and it's this awful perpetuating yeah. cycle. So I wonder like firstly, do you have any sort of really specific body image tips for people who are living in a larger body and are just facing all these pressures from diet culture? Yes, the pressures are very difficult. So I'm glad you asked this question. I'm in a larger body for those of you who don't know. And a lot of the tips that I suggest to my clients are things that I've used myself and that I've learned myself along the way. The first is make sure you are wearing clothes that fit you. A lot of times people in larger bodies think, oh, well, I shouldn't get the bigger clothes because that external number makes me a bad person or a worse person. And I need to be trying to get into these smaller sizes. So I need to hold on to my smaller size clothes. Well, when you have clothes that don't fit, they feel very uncomfortable on your body. And especially for neurodivergent folks, sometimes that kind of these pinching and the pressures of different areas of your body make you feel very uncomfortable. And in your larger body, it's just kind of this feeling like you're a bad person almost because your clothes don't fit. When there's nothing wrong with your body, it's like your body, it is what it is. You may not like it at that point. There are a lot of factors that go into body size with genetics and what your body has been through in your life and all those kinds of things. That's like a whole different podcast episode, but really having a wardrobe with clothes that fit and getting rid of clothes that don't fit. And I know for some people that's a big ask, but it is so important. And it is a gift that you can give yourself that say, I may not be excited about the size of my body, but I can respect it enough to give it clothes that fit. So there's a lot of different clothing stores. Most of them are online that sell extended sizes. And the UK actually has some really good stores. I can't think of them off the top of my head, 
that it maybe if I, I think of them later, you could put them in the show notes, but there are stores out there. And if you don't feel like going into a store, just order them online and order a couple sizes and then return the ones that don't fit you. But that is the biggest gift that you can give yourself. Overall, it's really focusing on what you can control today. I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm not talking about a month from now. I'm talking about today. It's like, what can I control today? Well, I can control how my hair is styled today. I can control what kind of makeup I'm going to have on or whether I'm even going to wear makeup. I can control the kind of jewelry I wear. I can control accessories or the shoes that I wear, what kind of bag or purse I'm going to wear. Really focusing on that helps pivot your attention from focusing on a lot of the negative thoughts and emotions you have about your body to focusing on things that you can control. Like, for example, my favorite color is pink. Whenever I wear pink, I just feel really happy because I think it's a happy color. (laughs) So if I'm wearing pink, I'm like, oh, this is a very happy color. And so that helps me be happy. And that's something that I can control today. Today, I'm actually wearing red, which is also a happy color. And that helps me feel good because it's this lovely color. And it's really respecting myself enough to wear the colors and maybe even the patterns that make me happy. So clothes and focusing on what you can control. And also really remembering that we are more than our bodies. And I know that's really hard in a world with so much diet culture and anti-fat bias and weight discrimination. That's just everywhere you look, especially in the medical system. Really, you've got to make an effort to really focus on who am I at a soul level? Like, and I'm not talking about like religion or anything. I'm talking about like, who am I on the deep inside? And what are my characteristics? What are my hopes? What are my dreams? What helps me feel more connected with the world around me? What brings me joy? And asking those deeper questions can really get you in touch with who you are. And a dietitian friend of mine, that I recently interviewed on my podcast, Amy Ornelas, she talked about, she's like, I wish we lived in a world where we had almost no bodies, where we were just connected like spirit to spirit with each other. And what kind of beautiful world would that be? And it's really interesting to think about. And you could journal about that. It's like, what is my spirit like? I lived in a spirit only world. What would that be like? You know, would it be a good sense of humor? Would it be someone who, for me, loves Star Wars? <laughs> someone who stops and looks at the flowers and someone who enjoys cozy, rainy days or enjoys the sunshine or who loves traveling. And we are so much more than that. And I know that for someone who is struggling with negative body image thoughts, that can feel so hard to make the switch. It's almost like switching tracks on a train. And it can be a really powerful thing. It's just reminding yourself, I'm more than my body. Yes, I want to treat my body with respect. I want to nourish my body regularly throughout the day. I want to wear clothes that fit. I want to have like fun things about what I wear that make me smile, even if it's like a little bracelet that your kid made you or something like that. I want to And I want to remind myself that I am more on my bodies because sometimes people say that, oh, we have to focus on the functionality of our bodies and be appreciative of, I can move my arms, I can walk around. And yes, that can be helpful. It also can be a little ableist because not everyone can do that. So if we're focusing on more things like, wow, I have this really smart brain, like the very driven, high achieving people you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast episode, I have this wonderful brain and I can understand complex constructs and concepts. And that's a wonderful part of me that I'm very grateful for is really focusing on those things. Like, actually, I'm kind of fabulous (laughs) (laughs) And, and I'm a very loyal person. And I love showing up for my friends and family who are having a hard time, those kinds of things. Like, who are you in relationships to others, relationships to animals, to nature, that kind of thing. Mm, I think some really powerful, inspiring tips, actually. So thank you for sharing those. (laughs) Oh, it's my pleasure.
<laughs> and Marianne, just sort of touching briefly towards the end, obviously dealing with professionals sometimes who don't understand binge eating can be really challenging. And particularly, again, yeah. if you're in a larger body, like whatever problem you go with, you know, to your doctor, you can just be told to lose weight. Maybe you feel your binge eating isn't validated. Do you have any sort of like introductory tips for people navigating professionals in general? Yeah. If you're seeing an eating disorder therapist who specializes in binge eating or you're working with a binge eating coach, I would ask them for tips of medical professionals you can see that are more what we call Hayes focused, which is the Hayes health at every size focused and are more focused on body neutrality and really focusing on that health isn't all about what your weight is and stuff like that. That may not be possible with the NHS. <laughs> I don't know whether you can choose your provider, your medical provider. What I would go in, there is very specific agenda and say, I don't want to be weighed. And if they push it, they say, oh, well, you have to be weighed. Really, you don't need to be weighed unless you are going for an operation and the anesthesiologist needs to know what kind of anesthesia to pump into you. I mean, there may be a couple of more situations where they need your weight, but on a regular checkup, they really don't need to know what your weight is. And what I did when I was looking for a provider is I had an initial appointment with him and I said, listen, I have an eating disorder history and I've had a very bad experience with providers pathologizing me because of my weight and overly focusing on my weight, even when I asked them not to, would you be able to provide a weight neutral services that we don't talk about weight at all? We don't talk about food or eating at all. I have my eating disorder team that I'm working with, or I have already worked on that in the past with coaches and therapists or whatever. I've got that. <laughs> what I just need from you is medical advice that has nothing to do with my weight. And if the physician or medical provider says, yes, I can do that, then work with them. And if they say, no, I can't because weight is everything, then look for someone else. It's frustrating as anything <laughs> that you have to kind of go through the screening process, but that's just the reality because the medical system is so heavily entrenched in diet culture, anti-fat bias, weight discrimination. I mean, researchers have found that not just physicians, nurses, like other people who are medical providers. It's really important to screen and then ask around for tips of other people that might have had like a little better experience. But absolutely, you can say, I don't want to be weighed. And if they push it, just say, not going to do it. Like you're in charge of your medical care. So you don't need to be weighed. Yeah, I well, know. It's so helpful to hear that. And I think just you saying all of this out loud, it gives people permission to feel yes. they have more of a choice to step yep. more into an empowered place. Really, really helpful to share that, Marianne, because I think it's hugely challenging, isn't it? I know many of my clients struggle with this and feel a lot of shame around having to go for appointments and are often given perhaps very mixed messages from what the eating disorder team have been giving them. And it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. It really, really is. And it's really important to be your own advocate. And it's hard to do because of the power differential between you and the medical providers. And you feel like even though if you're like a top CEO at some big company, you walk in to the medical office and you see them in their white coats and it's like you feel like you've lost all your power and you have to remind yourself, I do have power. I can advocate for myself and mm -hmm. I can stand up for myself and they can't make me do anything I don't want to do unless I'm going to harm myself or someone else. They can't make me do anything. They can't make you weigh yourself. If you want surgery, that would be helpful for the anesthesiologist to know. <laughs> Even if they say, well, we need it for the medication, that still is not always accurate. And what I would do is say, I don't want to be weighed right now. And then have a conversation with your doctor you say, I just don't want this to be based on my weight. I don't want to have conversations about my weight. You can make an estimate without that or just give me the regular dosage and we can play around with it and see what works. Because 
to be honest, medications, a lot of times it doesn't have to do with body weight. <laughs> you know, it has to do with how people metabolize medications. And some people are more sensitive than others. And that doesn't have anything to do with body weight. I'm not a medical doctor, but this is something I've looked into. Yeah, no, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Marianne, where can people find you if they want to get in touch, find out about Dr. Marianne Land, etc.? Yeah, so I have a strong presence on Instagram. So it's at Dr. Marianne Miller, and that's M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E. That's how I spell my first name. So Dr. Marianne Miller on Instagram. Dr. Marianne Miller is my website. And my podcast is called Dr. Marianne Land and Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. And I release episode once a week, but I actually in a couple of weeks, I'm going to start releasing two episodes a week. So it's very exciting. And mm -hmm. I actually have a webinar coming up on, I believe it's Monday, March 25th. And that's at 11 a.m. Pacific. That's 7 p.m. UK time. And it's free. And if you just email me at hello at drmarianmiller.com, I can get you registered. The webinar is a case study of how one woman recovered from binge eating completely. And so Ooh. I would love to see you all there. Yeah. Okay, no, fantastic. Well, I'll make sure all of that goes in the show notes. Thank so you. that webinar, so it's Monday, March the 25th at right. 11 a.m. Is that Pacific Pacific time? So that would yeah, be so 7 kind of p.m. Evening. Yeah, yeah sure, 7 p.m. in the UK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Oh, it sounds really great. Always inspiring to hear a story, isn't it? Someone's yes. journey and how they've come through it. Right, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Marianne, for coming on the podcast again. I'm just so, so glad love to be hearing here. from you. Yes, I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much and look forward to kind of getting you back on again soon. And perhaps we'll have to do a whole deep dive into neurodiversity, maybe, if you'd be up for that, amongst other oh, topics. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. Yeah. yeah. It's always an honor to be on your podcast, Harriet. Oh, thanks so much, Marianne. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And do go and check out Dr. Marianne's information in the show notes. If you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you're a professional listening and you want to learn more about eating disorders and body image issues, link in the show notes to my online training courses. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. Mm -hmm.